Would you please bow your heads with me in prayer? Gracious Father, this morning I stand before your congregation, but I am just simply a very humble servant. So, Father, I ask that you would please, as you did with Jeremiah, take and coal with your tongs off of your holy altar. Touch those coals this morning to my lips, that my words will be your words. My thoughts become your thoughts. And that as the congregation hears, they don't hear Michael Cookenmaster, but instead they hear the word of the Lord. Thank you for being enthroned on the stage behind me today. Thank you for your love, and thank you most of all for this Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Bring them in. Picking up where the allegory of Pilgrim's Progress ends. The book Hind's Feet on High Places tells the story of a maiden named Much Afraid. She lives in the village of Much Trembling, located down in the Valley of Humiliation. Much Afraid works for the chief shepherd as an under-shepherdess. She loves the chief shepherd with all of her heart, but just as her name predicts, she's much afraid. She's afraid of her aunt, dismal forebodings, her uncle, old Lord Fearing, and of course her cousins, gloomy, bitterness, spiteful, pride, but worst of all, the cousin that she is betrothed to, craven fear. Every day she looks forward to meeting the chief shepherd at the trysting place because her job is to feed and water the shepherd's lambs. Much Afraid is always worried that her service to the chief shepherd isn't what it should be. After all, she's nothing like her next door neighbor, Mrs. Valiant. Much Afraid has deformities in her face, in her hands, she has crooked feet, and she's a cowardice. She knows that in order to climb up with the shepherd to the high places where the king of love is, the chief shepherd's father who lives in the king of love, she has to somehow be transformed. How can the chief shepherd even use somebody like her? How can he take her to live with him in the high places? It's just too much for her to even hope for. Just as the Bible can be filled with symbolism, allegories like those of Much Afraid and Hind's Feet on High Places tells a story that has a hidden meaning. Who are the lambs? The lambs represent our children. They're tender. They're susceptible. They're easily led astray. An old sheep herder once noted that the shepherd's job is not to protect the sheep from the wolves. It's to protect lambs from the wolves. The wolf will never go after a sheep if you can get a tender lamb. Who are the under shepherds and shepherdesses who are not hirelings? Who are the gratuitous baileys? The gratuitous baileys are the ones that the chief shepherd considers family members. The shepherd, according to, or the sheep, according to John 10, 12, belong to the shepherd they never belong to the hireling. So let's take a look at some Greek terminology today. In John 10, 12, we find out that there are three different types of hired shepherds. They're called mythstosos, which stands for hired servant. First, there is a gratuitous bailey. The gratuitous bailey swears everything he owns for the loss of the sheep due to his own neglect. He is free of liability for any unavoidable accidents, but because he is a family member, the chief shepherd holds him absolutely accountable. Then there is what we call a borrower bailey. A borrower bailey has to pay every time an animal is lost and it doesn't matter how that accident occurs. And then there is a hirer, Bailey. 
the hirer bailey is supposed to pay for the loss of the animal regardless of the accident and the hirer bailey is actually the least responsible when danger comes hirer baileys are notorious for running away so let's look at john 1:12 Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. So who are these lambs? Well, the lambs, again, are our children, tender, susceptible, easily led astray. Who are the under-shepherds and the shepherdesses who are not hirelings? They're family. They're the gratuitous baileys. They're the ones that the chief shepherd holds most accountable Would you please turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. If you've got it on your cell phone, that's easy. If you have the old-fashioned Bible, that takes a little longer. Let's read aloud together, please. I will be reading from the King James Version. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So who are gratuitous Baileys? They're the ones, remember, that are family. How do you become family? You have to receive the name. The name that you have to receive is Jesus' name. You are then given rights to become children of God, God no longer calls you a servant. He does more than that. And you are more than friend. He calls you family. The king of heaven calls you family. Much Afraid wants to live with the king, but she's not really fully accepted him into her heart. One day at the trysting place with the lambs, the chief shepherd asks if she would like to receive the flower of love. To bloom in her heart. And of course, much afraid does. The chief shepherd is filled with delight, plants a sharp thorn into her, causing immensely sweet pain. But when the plant of love is ready to be bloomed, she knew that she was going to be loved truly by the shepherd in return, and she could live in high places. So you might be asking, what is all this symbolism about, and what does it have to do with Adventist education on Education Sabbath? So let me tell you who all these characters are. Much Afraid works with lambs, right? She's an under-shepherdess, right? Much Afraid is the Adventist school teacher. She is a member, though, of the Fearing Clan. She's completely unfit for her duty. She avoids her aunt, Dismal Forebodings. She avoids the well-meaning busybody, Dismal Forebodings the dismal forebodings that is the busybody in church who is filled with negativity and dread and casts doubt on every plan that much afraid might have for herself or for her school. She's also frightened by old uncle Lord Fearing. He's the social financial powerhouse in the congregation. He can make or break her ministry by withholding funds. She feels completely powerless against her cousin, Craven Fear. He's a notorious bully, the unruly parent that's never satisfied or causes disruption. She's saddened by her cousin's spiteful, gloomy, pride, bitterness. They all represent those that don't believe that Adventist quality of education actually exists. As you can see, poor Much Afraid, Without any help from the chief shepherd, the dear Adventist school teacher will accomplish absolutely nothing. So let's take a look at some myths that we have in our church about Adventist education. The first myth, Adventist education in schools is very poor. Actually, Adventist education equals and is often better than that of public education, but we never, according to statistics, fall below 
public education. Let's look at myth number two. Adventist teachers are completely unqualified for the job. Actually, all Adventist teachers that are hired by the conference office have to hold a bachelor's degree or higher. All of our teachers have to meet not only state requirements to teach, but we also have to meet church requirements to teach. We have to take more coursework in order to serve you and your children in our schools. Let's take a look at myth number three. Better facilities would equal a better education. Actually, Ellen White tells us that that formula for true quality education is simply having a harmonious development of spirit, mind, and body. She never talks once about the facility at all. Now, let's talk about mind, body, and soul. God is not interested in your child being successful. Instead, he is interested in your child being sincere. God is not interested in your child's academic achievement, as important as that is, and he knows that in this world. Instead, he wants your child to be completely obedient. Your child is not interested, or God is not interested in your child's talent. He gave them the talent. Instead, he wants their commitment. God is not interested in your child's possessions because he owns everything already. Instead, he wants your child's passion. God is not interested in your child's outer beauty. Instead, he wants the inner beauty to reflect Christ. God is not interested in how much your child knows because they're going to spend eternity learning. Instead, he's interested in your child being loyal. God is not interested in your child's abilities, for after all, he gave it to them. Instead, he wants your child's ambition. God is not interested in having your child some of the time in Sabbath school or church, or possibly pathfinders or adventurers. He wants them all the time. God has not prepared our children to go to hell. For after all, hell was made for demons. He has made them to spend an eternity with him. Myth number four. Public, charter, and magnet schools are better equipped to prepare our children for the real world. It is actually the object of Adventist education to develop in our children deep moral, ethical convictions so that they can function in the real world. And we are preparing them for the world that is yet to come. Let's take a look at some facts. In the United States alone, last year, there were 69,000 abortions performed on girls who were under the age of 18. There were three million runaways, and they were students ages 10 to 18. There were 13,000 suicides of children ages 10 to 18 last year. There were 17.1 million children with serious psychotic disorders. There are 19.7 million Americans that are age 12 or older who are addicted to drugs. 25% of all serious crimes committed in the United States are committed by children who are under the age of 16. There are over 10 million gays and lesbians, the majority of them young people serving in a teaching force promoting their lifestyles in public schools. Is that the real world? that public school is preparing your children for? A world that can be best described by the Apostle Paul as aliens from a commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You can find that in Ephesians 2.12. It's the object of education 
Adventist education to develop in our young people deep moral ethical convictions so that they do function in a real world, but we have to give them the appropriate tools to do so. And we are commissioned to prepare them for the world that is yet to come. I often thought I have done this sermon one other time and I have a large white rope. The last time I did this, I was in a black congregation and the head elder got up and wanted everybody to know, and I was serving as the associate superintendent of the conference at the time, and they wanted to know that I was the only white man in the building and that I had brought a rope with me. And the whole congregation erupted in laughter. But with this big white rope, normally what I would do is I would have one of my students, I would hold one end of the white rope, and they would take the other end of the white rope and go all the way out into the foyer with it. And at the end that I'm holding, is about one inch of red. And that one inch of red represents your life on planet Earth as it exists now. The white that stretches all the way out into the narthex represents eternity that is yet to come. And I say, some of us are so focused on what's happening in the red zone that you will never get to the white. Don't look at what is now. Look at what is promised yet to come because we are preparing for a much better land. But if you are focused on the red, gaining what you can in the moment, the glories of the white are not yours to have. You have to put your time, your money, your energy, your passion, your ambition, everything that you want your child to give, you have to be willing to sacrifice and give yourself. The chief shepherd, oops, I'm sorry, the chief shepherd, who always knows what's best, gave much afraid two companions on her way to the high places. And I'm going to ask my class, because we just finished this book, what are their names? Sorrow and Suffering. So back to this story of Much Afraid, the Adventist school chief uh, teacher who has sorrow and suffering helping her to get to the high places. Their names are sorrow and suffering for a reason. For every time Much Afraid needs help, she has to put her hands into their hands, and she is wracked with pain and sorrow. Frightened, much afraid, still dedicated to the chief shepherd, sets off on her journey with sorrow and suffering, and she knows that the chief shepherd can't always be where she can see him. But she chooses to go on the journey anyway because he has promised that if she relies on sorrow and suffering, that they will actually be of benefit to her. And when everything seems hopeless and she can't go on, she can then cry out, and no matter where the chief shepherd is in his kingdom, he will come leaping and bounding within a moment to her side. Following the path that the chief shepherd has laid out for her, much afraid enters the forest of danger and tribulation. Coming through the other side of the forest, he leads her to the furnace of Egypt. Coming out of the desert of Egypt, she finds that she has entered a valley of loss. And coming out of the valley, she realizes that she has dead-ended on the precipice of injury. And making it over the precipice, she realizes that she's back in a forest. This forest has lightning that crashes and thunders and brings down trees that are the size of redwoods. But she's willingly taken the hand of her companions. She has willingly followed the path of the chief shepherd. She has been led out of the forest and discovers that the plant of love is truly blooming in her heart. Met by the chief shepherd in the forest, she is then immediately ushered up into high places where all is happiness. 
where she is no longer now much afraid. But as the chief shepherd has promised, she receives a new name, and her name is now Grace with Glory. And even her two companions, Sorrow and Suffering, have changed their names, for she did not realize that while she thought she was being helped by them, she was actually helping Sorrow and Suffering. And so the chief shepherd changes their name, and they become who? Joy and Peace. Let all that come to these words be melted and subdued. This is from the book Education. Where there are churches, let there be schools. Work as if you're working your life to save your children from being drowned in the polluting, corrupting influences of our time. Then in special testimonies to church schools, Ellen White wrote, let all who hear these words come melted Work as though you are working to influence for eternity. Each one of us, whether you are an Adventist school teacher or not, or not, have been commissioned to reach a dying world, a world that is dying for a lack of a want of knowledge of a loving, crucified, risen, soon coming Savior. We need to wake, break away from our club mentality. We need to reach out, invite community members into our school, into our churches, into our home. Limca has a great potential for good in Cheyenne. I stand before my students 180 days. That's 180 days of public evangelism. It is the one full-time ministry of this church and I wish to thank you for supporting our current students. But will you also not support those students, whether they're Adventist or not, who the Lord sends to the school with your offerings and with helping with tuition assistance? Because we live in a financial time where parents often want their children in a private Christian environment, but we have created a have and have not society. So will you support non-Adventist children who come? Will you support by placing grandchildren, inviting neighbors and friends into our school? We need to understand something. You can clearly see the signs of the times. You can see that the king of the north and the king of the south, who sit at the same table and who negotiate with each other quite well, are putting on a show for all of you. You saw it last Thursday night. What you don't know is that those two men are actually friends. And they golf together. And they go on vacations together. It's a show. And they're setting you up for the show because you're the goyim. You're the little people who shouldn't know better. But God has given us a script. He tells us what's going to happen. He tells us about social unrest. He tells us about financial distress. He tells what the little horn with eyes and mouth who speaks blasphemous things is doing behind the scenes. None of this should catch an Adventist off guard if you are awake. Wake up. Jesus is coming soon. Hark! It is the shepherd's voice I hear.